going on, everybody? Griffin Della Pena back again for another episode of the Griffin Report. First one here in 2023, and we are starting out with a very, very good guest. He's a member of the Kenesha Sports Hall of Fame. During his five seasons with the men's basketball program, he has 754 career wins at the collegiate level, and he's just one of seven coaches to bring four different programs to the NCAA tournament. Was most recently a 2022 inductee of the College Basketball Hall of Fame and was recently named a 2023 Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame potential nominee for this upcoming class. Mr. John Beeline, thanks for joining me here today. Thanks, Griffin. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a truly an honor to have you on. I know last night you were busy with the Pistons, as that's your current role right now uh, with that organization now jumping to the NBA. What has that been like? for you transitioning to pro basketball and being with some young stars like Kate Cunningham and Jaden Ivey? I think the bigger transition, Griffin, is not being a head coach for the first time in my life. That's the biggest transition of how do you make the team better without being the guy on top mm -hmm. and knowing when to talk, when not to talk, uh, trying to support the coach every day to make him the best coach he can be. So that's that's the bigger thing. But, you know, most of the guys that I work with, I would half the team uh, are not older than Michael Meeks or Craig Wise or Damone James or any of those guys that I first coached when I got to Canisius. So uh, it's a lot of the same things, except you play every other day. And so that's the challenge. You just don't get to practice like you could when I was at Canisius. Yeah, I saw last night. It was a nice win against the Timberwolves. So a guy that I've always liked to follow is Isaiah Stewart, 5'8", 5 guy, grew up playing yeah. against him. So yeah. uh, he's also a great guy to coach as well. But we'll go back to your roots. Your Western New York guy uh, grew up around the Lockport area, went to high school there, and then you went to Wheeling College. So how big was basketball for you growing up? Uh, it was, I mean, I played all three sports through most of high school. Uh, and stopped playing football in my junior year, but played all the other sports. And then, you know, but I grew up a big little three fan. Uh, my uncles, Tom and Joe Nyland, were were stars at Canisius. Joe actually, uh, Joe coached at Canisius. You know, Tom uh, Tom coached at uh, Lemoyne, and then my uncle Mike Nyland was the coach at Bishop Duffy uh, and and Doherty. So I was like, my dad worked in a factory and 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 became a front office there, but. All I grew up with was around sports and the little three games with Canisius and uh, and St. Bonaventure and Niagara were that that was the NBA to me at that time. And um, bit, a bit of a Niagara fan because we were closer and Calvin Murphy came in. Mm -hmm. But don't tell, don't tell Tony Massiello that because <laughs> I would have rooted for him too anytime. You, know, you rooted for all three teams, but. Um, the one that I could get to the games earlier, a 20 minute drive instead of 40 minute drive seemed to be the easiest one, but I love basketball from the beginning and I had great mentors around me, Griffin. And it's all I wanted to do, including my uncles is to be a teacher and a coach, be like them. And uh, yeah. the dream came true. And that was right out of the get go. So you graduate, then you start coaching at New Fane High School, and then your first collegiate job was at Erie Community College. Now, there's something that I just learned very recently when I first uh, spoke to you and Reggie was you had a young guard named Reggie Witherspoon, and he would later follow your path and coach yep. at ECC and then Canisius. So how cool was that to yeah. have him as one of your first players in those first few years of you being a collegiate coach? Yeah, you know, when I first, I was three years in high school, and all of a sudden I'm named the, the junior college coach there in a program that had not used to be very powerful and had not won a little bit. And I was trying to figure it out and brought a bunch of recruits in the first year. But then in the second year, we were able to get some local guys to come in, Reggie being one. Uh, and, and it changed our program. Re Reggie was part of a, a huge renaissance there where Erie Community College got back in that junior college hunt. Um, we had great success. A lot of it was because of Reggie, and Reggie brought a lot to the program. A local kid, a really good high school player in the area that chose to stay local and go to a junior college. Um, and then he even went to Wheeling College after that. Uh, Wheeling Jesuit at that time. It was a Jesuit school at that time. So uh, we, we were both ended up, uh, you know, uh, going there and graduating from there. And those are, those are, those are things we have in common. We still, I just texted him the other day after we beat Manhattan the other day, 
and St. Peter's and uh, swept that trip. That's not easy to do. Yeah, it was a very impressive trip for sure. And hopefully we'll continue that into this week against Marist and Siena. But you continue to work your way up the coaching ranks. Then you went to D3, Nazareth uh, in Rochester, and then Lemoyne in Syracuse. Then you get the job at Canisius in 92. So you were actually one of the finalists back in 87 for the Canisius job. And you then, know your stuff. Oh, I did my research, coach. I did my research. But uh, what was that like for you then? I know you mentioned you were a fan of the program growing yeah. up to then get your first Division One experience, being a Western New York guy at Canisius. Well, I, I was uh, very disappointed. I didn't get the job first in, back in 87 or 88, whatever it was. But, you know, and we had had monster years at Lemoyne, another Jesuit school. So we uh, – but you know what? It allowed me in those next few years, I sort of reinvented myself as a coach, and it got me much more prepared for the, for the second opportunity uh, where I could uh, interview at Canisius. And thank, God, thank goodness that, you know – there were some courageous people in that room, uh, D Dr. Dan Starr, uh, Tom Miller, Father Dembski, that took a chance on the Division II guy with virtually no Division I experience and just give me the opportunity to see what we could do. And um, I was thrilled. I mean, to go walk in and be coaching the Griffs uh, at Kessler or in the old odd for the first times, I mean, it was magical to me. It was really uh, – I could, I could see myself if – if things didn't lay out the way they were, you know, still being the coach at Canisius now, some 25, 30 years later. Um, and I would be very happy living in that community, but um, there, there were some other opportunities that I want to pursue. So I just, uh, that, that, but those five years were, were absolutely fantastic and uh, love the players still contact with the players had dinner with Craig wise just two nights ago in Philadelphia and uh, just had a wonderful experience, my family and I, for those five years. And going into your first season, like you just mentioned, you were taking over a program that was 8-22. and 22. And in your five seasons at Canisius, you had an 89-62 and 62 record. You won the MAC after back-to-back -back appearances in the NIT. As a coach, specifically in your first real experience at the Division I level, how – important was that for you to have such a dramatic change of uh, honestly a complete 180 in such a short amount of time the um I, I mean I, I that first year Griffin was so hard 10 and 18 and uh it was really uh it was really difficult uh to get through that year because the years at Lemoyne were much different but it really set the stage where we could grow um the uh, the administration was good enough to allow us to go to Portugal that summer and do a summer tour, which was really advantageous to our following season. And then we, uh, uh, it, we just took off. I mean, it just took off about mid season where we won a 16 in a row or something. So I was, uh, it, it just was, it was fantastic for me and my family and, and, uh, great highlights whether it was winning the winning the mac championship in albany or beating washington state in the odd in front of 11,000 people uh and the, to still remember the students out there that while new york new york was on the uh was coming over the loudspeakers it was it was amazing amazing thing and then coach i know you just mentioned some of your more memorable times on main street or at the odd but are there any other specific games that first come to mind when you look back at your time at Canisius? Griffin, there's so many. Right. I mean, the first win against St. Francis PA was what was like, I didn't know if we'd ever win a game. I just didn't even know if we'd ever win a game that whole first year to all the way that uh, Binky Johnson made a great shot against Iona to beat them in a 2-7 game to start. We had not won a MAC conference game in a long time. He, he, uh, Mac uh, tournament game. We've been in the eight, nine game like three years in a row. And all of a sudden now we're in the semifinal. Those, th that was a pivotal. I thought that was a pivotal point in our program where kids believed after that we had every, we had no seniors on that team. And that's when we, we won a regular season championship in the Mac and the Mac is still good. Was a monster then with eight teams that with, one year we had three, t two teams go to the NCAA tournament and, and two go to the NIT. Can you imagine getting four bids? So Great. the league was so strong and we wanted going away in the regular season. 
So it should tell you, you know, what type of young men we had on that team. And uh, it just that that was amazing. But to, to answer your question, there's way too many. There's way too many. I, I mean, I'll remember the time we, we were down 21 nothing to Niagara to start a game in the new arena. We opened up the new arena, fourth year, uh, fourth year, and we were down 21 to nothing in the game. And we lost badly, obviously, but we beat them this in February. And then we beat them again in March. So we got better. So there was these pivotal moments that are just like uh, tipping points to go either way. And we always seem to be, be able to get through them and make progress. You had some really great players in those teams as well. Some Hall of Famers with you now in the Kenesha Sports Hall of Fame. Are there any good stories from some of those guys that maybe you and the coaching staff know that you can share with me that maybe a lot of well, people don't know about? I, I just found this out and and because it wasn't in my memory, but I, I told you I had lunch with Craig Wise. And this was after his freshman, his sophomore year. And he and I used to butt heads a lot his first year. And uh, we went to Portugal that year. And he just told me I left him back at the hotel because he was late for the bus. I had forgotten all about that. <laughs> and that um, he uh, he got he somehow got to the game and all was forgiven at some time. But it's like uh, you find out all these stories later on when I when I get with them because we were very demanding. Uh, I, I mentioned it was uh, it was if for some reason December Christmas Eve always sticks out to me because we'd gone to Colgate and we'd lost badly in that first year and we came back and got home at two in the morning on Christmas Eve I slept in my office because Damone James wanted to shoot the next day because he didn't have a shooting that good shooting day and there I am at Christmas Eve at 10 a.m. 10 a.m. 9 a.m. shooting with Damone in the Kessler so I mean there were so many times I, there was a fight once I won't describe who it was we were struggling in my second or third year a fight broke out in practice one of our guys on the football team was in it, and I, I saw Mike Meeks or Craig Wise. It was somebody running at somebody ready to throw a haymaker with his right hand, and I'm, like, trying to grab the right hand before it gets broken. And you know what? The team came together. We, we, we won the next two games, St. Peter's and Manhattan, and, our t and we took off after that. So there's so many things that happened, and you probably have to talk with my players to get – even more stories. Right. And it's still crazy that decades later, like this stuff for you, it's still there. And all the other experiences that you have that, that just shows how special Canisius was for you. Uh, and, and I see pictures of when we were waiting to go, when we got made the NCAA tournament and everybody in there. And of course my children are then, you know, in uh, very, very young and like second uh, for kindergarten, second, now they're in their thirties and forties, my children. It's just uh, the support I had, from the Canisius community, from our staff, from the faculty, from the students was absolutely amazing. And uh, so what, a, I mean, that was a storybook. Uh, that was a storybook situation for me growing up in that area, loving little three basketball and then getting to coach the Griffs. Yeah. And then even a few years ago, you still felt that love back in 2019 when you were inducted into the yeah. Canisius Sports Hall of Fame. How was that experience for you to then come back here to Western New York, to Buffalo, and receive that honor at a place that really jump-started your whole career? Really, Griffin, the things that I loved the most, and I did love that, was very nice of them. But I also returned for Binky Johnson's Hall of Fame, Craig Wise's Hall of Fame, uh, Daryl uh, uh, Barley's Hall of Fame, Michael Meeks, uh, I think I might have missed Craig's. We might have had a game that day. But the other ones, we didn't have a game wherever I was coaching and was able to go back and see them go in the Hall of Fame. That's what that's where you really are happy. And uh, but I was honored by that, certainly. But I guarantee you, I wouldn't be in there right now if it wasn't for those other gentlemen I just named. Uh, they could have gone in the Hall of Fame with anybody coaching them. I couldn't have gone in the Hall of Fame without them playing for me. Yeah, that, that is really cool. And after your time at Canisius was done, you then go to Richmond and you followed a very similar track record there. Uh, at the time, you know, Richmond, they were struggling. They were trying to get back to their winning ways. 
Uh, you went to the NCAA tournament in year one and then two more trips to the NIT in five seasons yet again. But I did read that in your opening round of the NIT, you won over West Virginia. And long story short, that played a role in you eventually getting the job there. So is that true? Um, you'd have to ask the West Virginia people because they also, I think they had an agreement with Bob Huggins after that. But then he turned it down. Then Dan, Dan Dockage took the job for like two weeks, and then he left. And I was the I was the third the the, the double bridesmaid here. I was the third one, uh, but I'm sure that's why I might have been the third one is and not the tenth one. Mm -hmm. Was I was in there and uh, really left another place. I mean, when I left Canisius and I left Richmond both times, I wept when I was leaving those houses or saying goodbye to the players. I'm getting emotional now. Yeah. Um, you get so in by with them. I mean, I still hugging, I remember still hugging Javon Moore and, and uh, you know, some of the players that we left and the same thing at Richmond, but there was opportunities. I loved the big East at that time. I wanted every opportunity to go to the big East and that's where West Virginia was. And uh, whether I was the third man or the first man, I didn't care. I wanted that chance. And your son, Patrick actually played for you at West Virginia you went to the Elite Eight in 2005, but your trip to go there in year three as a seven seed was pretty remarkable. You beat Chris Paul in Wake Forest, and then you played Texas Tech and Bobby Knight, and you, you had a really great run there uh, with yeah. the Mountaineers. So how special was that after you made another trip to the Sweet 16? How cool was that to be coaching again, like you said, in the Big East, but also to have your son at your side? It, it was right. To have Patrick with me, it was, it was amazing because – at Richmond, we had to go in a little bit. We had a stock roster, and he wanted to go to Richmond and play for me and and play for us. And uh, I told him you'd have to wait a couple of years. And then all of a sudden, I go to West Virginia. We got we have like one or two people left on the roster. It's 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 in disarray. And I said I told him I need you at West Virginia. He said I can't play at Richmond, but now you need me at West Virginia. And it all worked out. He scored a thousand points. That our him and Piss and I went back and forth at setting the three point record. Uh, but it would, you know, that was a, uh, another th time that it was amazing time in our lives. And, uh, we, we loved our time there as well. And we're able to have some, some real success. Um, and we could not have done it again without really good players, support of the administration, the whole deal. But we made that run, uh, to beat, uh, you talked about beating Wake Forest. Any times I've seen Chris Paul in the NBA game since then. Uh, he remembers it. He remembers the day. And uh, so do a lot of people. But uh, it, it was uh, we everything. Everything's turned out like we, we won every game. It was like I was going to daily mass at the time. And I, I still said it, that had a lot to do with all these breaks we got during the uh, during that March. And even after Patrick left, you still had a lot of success there. You ended up winning the NIT in 2007 which also then kind of gave you another opportunity, opened another door uh, to where you spent the bulk of your career at the University of Michigan, spent 12 seasons there, immense success, a 278 and 150 all-time record, two Big Ten regular season championships, postseason championships. And then I think that this is the caveat is with six of your nine March Madness appearances, you went to the Sweet 16 or further, which that's unprecedented success right there. But how did your coaching style change once you got to the University of Michigan yeah. in comparison to your previous stops? Yeah. Griffin, it changed every place from Erie to Nazareth to Lemoyne. It changed from Lemoyne to Canisius. And also what's happening at that time is the game is changing. The three point shot came in in 86 or 80, 86, 87. Uh, the shot clock came in. It was 45 when I came to Canisius Then it was 35. Uh, and so you just, what you learn to do, the only way that we were able to su survive, uh, all those coaching stops is evolve. So, uh, yeah, we probably began to get in West Virginia who could say we had better players at Michigan. Heck, we went to the lead We were shot the balls in the air. And if it goes in or uh, we we're going to the final four at West Virginia, or they, they shot a, a Louisville shot a ball that was an air ball that we get the rebound, we win, but because an air ball, sometimes you don't get the rebound because you're boxing out. They got it and put it in to, to tie the game. 
to put it into overtime. So there's all kinds of breaks, but those West Virginia teams were really good. And But Michigan, it took a while. that uh, We had three tough years to begin. The administration, the president stuck with us. And then um, we we just really, we, we changed a lot in how we coached and relationship building with our team, uh, relationship building among the coaches, uh, realized that the generations of young men were changing and we had to adapt. And uh, also knowing that we'd have guys that, that a lot of the country was going one and out, how were we going to navigate that? And so we cho- made some choices not to navigate it, just recruit four-year players. And son of a gun, we had 10 first-round draft choices. So we had a bunch of few one-and-outs, but a lot of two-and-outs and, and right. three-and-outs. So it all worked out and blessed to be able to, to, to do that for 12 years. What a place and a uh, great run for my family and I. I know that that 2010-2011 season was really big for you because going into that year, you were picked – 10th out of 11 teams in the preseason poll. And you ended up having another historic run that kind of transcended you guys into that championship run in 2013. Can you just talk to me a little bit behind the scenes and on how you tried to evolve that program at that time? Well, you're right. We were picked 11 out of 11. I I, I believe. And we, um, we just went into the season. We, and, and we, we ended up getting actually off to a good start. And then we were one in six to start the big 10. And Griffin, the, the the drums were beating. It was my fourth year. So we would have had a 10 and 18, an NCA bid, you know, a 15 and 16 or something. And now it looked like a losing season. And uh, we just like, went with a great confidence from my AD, Dave Brandon, uh, we just like went on a run all of a sudden. And uh, we, heck, we were almost in the Sweet 16 that year. We Duke beat us. We had a buzzer beater to beat Duke. And we lost, and it didn't go in. And uh, so it's, it, it just sort of, everything sort of fell into place. And the team uh, just, we, we just really concentrated on culture more than new plays, about relationships more than new plays. Um, concentrated on recruiting guys that wanted Michigan, that didn't want, you know, other things, didn't come there for the reason of, shoe sneakers or NBA or, you know, cause they liked our uniforms or they came for the real intrinsic reasons of an education and, and coaching and, and being coached at, in, in a, a positive environment. And it all worked out. All of a sudden we, we really went on another great run. Yeah, and in 2013 and 2018, the Wolverines made it to the national championship game, bringing that national prestige back for the program since the Fab Five days. That was really the first time since then uh, in those early 90s days. But during both of those championship runs, did you have a chance to maybe step back and recognize how special that experience was for you? Or was it just such a whirlwind with everything going on that you didn't get to in the moment? Yeah, I, I that's my biggest regret. I never really stepped back. And it was always on to the next game, on to the next game. When I When we played in Atlanta, in front of 70,000 against Syracuse and Louisville. I mean, I didn't even look up in the stands. And when I got all done with it, we came home, we'd lost a tough one to Louisville. I said, why didn't I do that? Why didn't I embrace that a little bit more? I said, I doubt if I'll have another other chance, but we do have a chance. Uh, I'm going to look up in the stands and look and see where is that 70,000 person that bought a hundred dollar ticket way up there. And sure enough, we got there back to San Antonio, and I did it. I looked all around and, and enjoyed it more. But you don't have time to, Griffin, really. You just don't have time. Um, and Michigan Nation was all over it, so it's not like you, you, you're, you have nothing to do during the day. Right. You know? And I always thought that was a big part of my job is uh, public, rela- uh, public relations and being a man of – a Michigan man that, that you know – uh, I wanted to make every autograph I signed or every person I talked to feel like they were very important. And um, it really, uh, it, it was a busy time, but I don't regret anything there. It was great. And during your time at Michigan, you weren't just beloved by Big Blue Nation, but even across the country, you were extremely well-respected, uh, always one of the premier coaches in terms of postseason awards, but also 
you did it by the book. You were a guy that took all of the rules very seriously. You weren't going to do anything shady. How important was that for you, not just in terms of the Michigan program, but for you as a coach to, to do everything by the book? Well, the integrity part is something I learned from my uncle, Tom Nolan, the, the Canisius, former Canisius player and uh, Lemoyne AD. And he was the chairman of the ethics, or he was the chairman of the infractions committee for the NCAA. When at SMU football went on the death penalty, he was the chairman. So he was all about integrity every minute and really taught me that you'll never get yourself in trouble if you follow the spirit of the rules, as opposed to find ways around the rules or, you know, push the envelope a little bit on rules. Just what's the spirit of them? And you'll be in good shape. And so by doing that and mandating our staff did that, I guess we got quite a reputation for that. And but it made it so much easier. And we found that parents and 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 prospects. The ones that didn't get that when they wanted, you know, uh, me to bump them or talk bump is when you a legal contact mm -hmm. after a game or meet with them or buy them a lunch or. Oop. So a little technical difficulty there, but. Let me start again. No, you're all good. No, so the um, the ones that did not get that we were going to be clean and everything that we did, we didn't want. It was okay. We didn't care what we didn't get. We cared who we got. And the ones that would, you know, I, I, I wait after a game and a parent would go up to another coach and a coach would talk with them right after the game and it was illegal. And uh, then they'd come to me and I'd say, backpedal gracefully i know this is awkward but i can't talk with you at this in this environment and just walk away there's a lot of people that said man who do i want my son to play for and some people might want the other guy and that's okay we didn't care but the one that felt wow this is a guy that i we can count on he does things the right way he follows the rule of the law and um, I, I thought it helped, really helped it actually helped us in recruiting didn't hurt us. And you did mention earlier that you coached 10 NBA draft picks during your time at Michigan. Uh, I've been a fan of, of many of them. I remember Trey Burke during that 2013 run. I loved him. But who do you think is the most talented player that you oh, coached during that time? Griffin, Maybe you give me a top you're gonna three. Get a, you a top think you're, three. Gonna, you're not even getting the top three. <laughs> you ain't getting the top one. Because um, there was – and I don't know – there was – I don't know the exact number. There's an – now, because there, there's been several, so it, there was there were several second rounders too, and to put that in perspective, of that, now to keep in mind we did not recruit a lot of five star guys. Um, that the uh, Michigan hadn't had a, a guy drafted in the in the first round in like since in since '98 before Trey went in the first round in '13. So that's quite a gap of no first round. Jamal Crawford went, but he really didn't finish the year with Michigan. So uh, then all of a sudden it was, you know, two, one, a, one a year at least for the next several years. And so, but I have no favorites. It's like you saying to me, which one of your children do you like the most? You're, right. you're not getting that answer. I don't like, I don't like any over the other. I love them all. And that's how I feel about my team. And 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 let me say this, and I don't care if they were drafting the NBA or not. They could have been the last guy, you know, on the bench. I just talked with John Gorman yesterday, who was a Canisius graduate uh, and was on our bench as a walk-on at Canisius. And I'm talking to him, you know, one day. And Josh Bartlestein, who was a non-scholarship player, is my assistant GM now at Detroit. I value them all the same because they're all special. Yeah, that's very cool. That's very cool of you. Another guy I love too, Jordan Poole. It's, I bet that's very cool for you to see the success that he's having now as well. Yeah, he's amazing talent. And he is really, he went to the perfect situation for him where uh, they really have an experienced team that it's a tough transition going from just two years in college and you're 20 years old. And all of a sudden now, as I'm living right now in NBA life, it is very, very difficult for a 20 year old and uh, Clay and Seth, uh, uh, Steph, and um, have really, and Draymond Green have done a wonderful job of developing them. Steve Kerr is the best, absolutely the best. 
So he's in a great environment. He's comes from great stock, great family. He's really taking advantage of it. Very happy for him. And Steve Kerr, that's uh, interesting that you bring his name up. Not too long ago, he actually name dropped Canisius in uh, in a press conference. I don't know if you knew about that, but he was talking about four year players like how Tim Duncan at Wake Forest and uh, and David Robinson, and then he's like, now you have guys that are you know they're not four four year guys like they're playing at Canisius anymore. So we got a good kick out of that. Wow, uh, no, yeah, that, that was good that, for us. That's terrific. No, that's terrific. No, I, I hear that all the time, and that's why the transfer portal thing, you know, it's 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 whether it's good or bad, I think is going to be judged over the next few years, and whether we uh, they're taking a look at it and see if it works. The NIL thing as well, um, they're all very. I think I've taken a reserved look at it until I see how it all sort of uh, well how it all evolves right now, because it's. Um, it, it's a it's a very different dynamic than when I coach. And I, you know, I look at that team at Canisius and I go in there and Craig Wise and Dana Johnson, both from Philadelphia. I am sure Craig Wise was rookie of the year in the Mac. I'm sure he could have ended up at, if he could have transferred right away, he could have an, an ended up at St. Joe's or Villanova or something like that. And uh, Mike Meeks after his first year could have ended up, you know, some, he could end up at, at Syracuse. My goodness. So it's like there's something that we're missing there in the intangibles, but there's also, I get it, that that it may be good. Some coaches can, you know, there's more fluidity and you can recruit new guys. Uh, I, I like the old way. I got to still got my eyes on whether this new way is going to ever work. So then my last question, you did somewhat mention it earlier that you did text Reggie after the recent sweep uh, this past weekend, but even with your busy life right now with Detroit being on the road and having that NBA lifestyle, how much time are you able to still follow the Griffs? And if you'll ever have, you know, in the next year or so, a chance to come back here to Western New York and on main street. I mean, every score, I, I follow every score. I thought there's six guys right now that either played for me or coached with me as a division one coaches. Uh, there is, uh, I don't even know the numbers. It's in the teens of the guys that coached or played for me that are assistants on Division One. So uh, I follow all of them. At, you know, every every day, I'll, every morning, I'll get up and I'll look over all the scores, and then I'll check the standings. And I just um, with with all my former teams or, or places that former players are at. Just it just happens to be extremely. Uh, uh, it's it's great. They're both a former player is at a former college of mine. So it makes it really unique. That's why I root for him. That's awesome. Again, coach, thank you very much for your time today. It was great getting to talk to you again, a Canisius legend. You don't get to talk to those every single day. So I, I really do appreciate your time. Well, we had Griffin, we have a uh, similarity with my, my wife's maiden name is Griffin. Uh, my daughter, uh, his name, it, her maiden name was Shauna Griffin Beeline. And uh, you get you get a proud name, right? And uh, be very and Canisius, right? They said it's it's made an impact on so many people, not only in Western New York but worldwide. Incredible Jesuit school that I'm so thankful for. They gave me the opportunity that they did. <laughs>